Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to the series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one I'm going to be going through three system neutral resources for GMs that are all just awesome. The first is the Sorcerer's Enclave by Aaron Howdle. The second is the Apocrypha, which is a book of speculative ages by Skirples. And the third is also by Skirples, Magical Industrial Revolution, a pre-apocalyptic setting guide. All three of these books are amazing. This is by far the longest, it's 156 pages. The Apocrypha is only 54 pages, and the Sorcerer's Enclave is only 48 pages. Now, all three, as I said, are system neutral. Um, and the first isn't, well, the first and the second, to some degree, are, are very much just in the realm of inspiration. They just get you thinking about things in a very interesting way. The Sorcerer's Enclave has no stats, no rolling, just art and lore, but the art is so evocative and the ideas are great. They're very whimsical and they take me back to a time of fantasy, like from the 70s or 80s, maybe even earlier than that. Um, there's a lot of inspiration, I think, from turn of the century, um, fairy tales, and the art style reminds me of something you might see in either those old books of fairy tales, the Book of Giants, or, you know, um, or things like um, maybe something from the Wizard of Earthsea or uh, the Chronicles of Prydain. They're just really, really beautiful pieces of pencil art, ink art that are just, I don't know, I think they're fantastic. Hopefully you guys will agree. I think this is also, the other two are pretty well known. Skirples is great. I love Skirples' work. Um, the Monster Overhaul is one of the best books out there. Magical Industrial Revolution is a joy to read. Apocrypha is hilarious. And I think, again, people know those. But the Sorcerer's Enclave is, I think, very, just less known. And in terms, it's almost more of an art book than it is uh, an RPG book. Well, here's what you get. Um, the world as it is known. Now, this is just sort of the background setting. You don't get many details about this at all. You get references here and there to bits and pieces. But really, what you're looking at is a particular part of this world. And here's what I meant about the art. Look at that. It's just gorgeous. It's a little busy, that that charcoal-esque look, right? Dark and the white. Um, just, it, it really does, at times, make it a little harder to see what's going on or the little details. But it's worth spending that time looking at it because it's very, very, very evocative, very, very imaginative. And I think that the actual lines are beautiful. And what's being shown is very great too. And again, these bits of fiction are fun as well. Cross the Inland Sea. Imagine, O traveler, the wild north. Then cast your inner eye east to the Inland Sea, the body of sweet water some 35 miles across its widest span. It is surrounded by dark forests to the south and the strongholds of the Dwarn and Nomen to the north. A difficult journey awaits those who wish to find it. The Inland Sea marks the farthest point west that any traveler in the north should venture. It's great. Now, as you go through, essentially, you're going through a wizard's sanctum, a wizard's academy, and you get cutaways of each of the buildings, each of the rooms, and what's going on in them, and the wizards that are there, and a little few details about it, like outside, you see the men here in the tree, and it talks a little bit about druids, and it's very little. Part sorcery and part religion, the druidic tradition transcends history as one of the oldest arts. The druidic practice encompasses magic from all schools. It is most closely associated with the natural world. In fact, druidic magic far predates the splitting of magic into different disciplines. Very few druids now remain in the world. This is great. You have a couple of uh, example druids there, and then you have a piece of art of a druid consulting the men here to the right. You have the natural arts, which is a, a development of the druidic arts, but more scientific, right? It's more magical um, in terms of, you know, being studied. Where the druid may balk at magic that profanes nature, the natural magician uses powers found in nature without concern for any side effects. So this is a really interesting, and again, to the right you have a wizard napping in his real chamber. You have a ladder leading up from his laboratory. There's a tower at the top. You have this laundry laid out across these bridges. And again, it's just imaginative and evocative, and all the little details on every page draw you in. I think it might be a little hard to see, um, again, just as a quick flip through, but zooming in, taking in the details, really worth it. This is a beautiful book in that regard. The Dueling Pit where elementals battle. Wizards aren't allowed to fight each other exactly in the school, but they can duel through magic. And then there's uh, the, the exception, of course, are the wizards marshal, who wear armor. They have a different bulk and phys physique than most ordinary wizards, because they have to fight and wear armor and use swords and things like that. The golem manufactory, great bits of information there. The minions, who have to wear these masks with bells on them. The alchemical arts. 
you have on minions and a whole passage on minions and what they're like. Minions are summoned to this place plane through complicated rituals requiring several wizards or witches. Once summoned, minions are usually, unusually subservient, often taking on the beliefs and some of the character of whichever master they serve. As such, minions serving a necromancer will behave very differently to those accompanying a nature witch. It is posited that in the strange realm they hail from, they serve far more powerful demonic entities than themselves. Simple survival requires this trait. Nobody has yet worked out if these imagined demonic overlords will tire of having their servants stolen. It's a cool idea, right? Every time you summon a creature as a wizard, maybe you're taking it from somewhere. And maybe the person or the, the thing, the place you're taking it from doesn't appreciate the fact that you're taking it from them. So conjurers, right? Conjurers are actually summoning from a different place, taking, stealing, even. Thief wizards. Great ideas like that. Familiars and how familiars work in this world, the observatory, the orrery, the arcanum of the, or the great library. Beautiful piece of art. And again, I, I, if you guys get this book, you should zoom in on the details here because there's great little details in that piece of art. The, master of sec the Masters of Secrets. The Portal Chamber. On and on this way through this book. Now, it's only 48 pages, but it gets darker and darker towards the very end because you start to get to the Eastern Tower, which is separated from the rest because it's a necromantic tower. And as another part of magic, nec nec necromancy should be studied, but it's you have to keep careful watch on those who would enter into it. And so it's kind of an interesting, dangerous element of this school. And towards the end, there's almost even a bit of a story as the as you get closer to there, it turns out that the necromancers have, have done something they ought not to do. And now there's a problem in the school that needs to be dealt with. But it's a great book. At the very end, there's sort of a detail of, uh, sort of a, a background of the artist's life. And he goes through his experiences and what turned him into this, or what turned him onto this particular style of art and all that. I'm not going to go through the whole thing because, again, as an art book, you want to have some of it. But I think this is just gorgeous. Really, really beautiful. Aaron Howdell, great artist. Absolutely great artist. Uh, packs a punch from, again, feels like those old school artists. Even though this was put together in 2022, it, it has a hallback. It looks like it could have come from the 19, you know, 1910 or 1920 in terms of its style. Or maybe the 1970s in a very particular era or, or you know, personal, uh, particular style of, of fantasy art. I love it. Absolutely love it. And I hope you guys check it out. I'll put links below to where you can get it. The next one I wanted to cover is The Apocrypha by Skirples. It's a very different kind of book. This one is, is 54 pages and it's all just, it's one big table. D100 table of ideas. And the ideas in it are fantastic. Essentially, each of these is an age of a world, or an age of a of the, this world, or something like that. See, Transit Gloria Mundorum. The Apocrypha, a collection of possible geological ages, exhaustively researched by Scribbles from the Coins and Scrolls blog, with additional insights provided by Dan D. and Dunkey Halton. Um, and then, copiously illustrated by Logan Stahl, with a thorough review by Fiona Geist, and thus assembled by David Schumers. Great art throughout. Well, not a ton of it, but there's enough that it's pretty good. <laughs> and you get the introduction to my esteemed colleagues and my hated rivals. In memoriam, and then the idea of deep time. The diversity of life and deep time travel. How to use this book, and then 1D100 time periods. They're, they're great, and they're all just very short paragraphs that tell you a little bit about what that age was like. Now, you could either use it as an age in your world, or as as the examples here, you could use it as a distant island, remain uh, distant islands remained behind while time flowed around them, the po trapped pockets of time, or they're traveling to a new place, a new a new part of the world, or a new dimension, or through a portal, or whatever it might be. Maybe they're time travelers, or maybe they are flung into a random period, or a random plane, or a random planet, or something like that. Right. So you can use this as the basis of your world. You could use this as a portal for, to a new world. If your players are doing a sort of time hopping campaign or a plane hopping campaign, you could use the Apocrypha really, really well. If you're doing like a spell jammer um, campaign or something like that, or, or a variation of the spell jammer campaign, then you could have a lot of fun with these. So the elemental eon, for example, a period of constant conflict. Alliances among air elementals violate the precepts of the noble gases and create water elementals. Earth elementals convene and start the protoplanetary revolution. Fire elementals undergo species-wide existential crisis after realizing that phlogiston doesn't exist. It ends with the formation of the periodic congress. So, phlogiston is or was this idea that there was this invisible fluid contained within combustible objects, and that when you burn something, the reason it got lighter 
Um, like if you took a, a you know a, a hunk of wood and you burned it and it turned to ash, the reason that the matter weighed less after you burned it than before was that it was losing phlogiston. It was losing this invisible fluid that disappeared into the ether. It was a real scientific theory for a while, and it explained a lot of things. It obviously had its uh, failings. But I think that's so funny. He talks about it. He says, this laughable theory has been superseded by the theory of caloric corpuscules. Yeah, so clearly we know better than that now. That was the oozyferous period. 95% of the planet's water in this period exists in the form of oozes. Puddles of ooze, lakes of ooze, oceans, rivers, and glaciers of ooze. Non-ooze life specializes in hunting and harvesting oozes, sustaining themselves on, the, on organelles and cytoplasm. The dominant solid being of this age was Peltrudia thublethimp, a being about a foot in length, possessing four articulated limbs, bulbous eyes, a long proboscis, and a lightweight skeleton. These are so good. This is so good. The Anuyaki experience. Extraterrestrial apotheosts arrive and cover the globe in stone pyramids and elaborate geoglyphs, geographs of birds. Local proto-elves are terribly confused, as they had already created stone pyramids and elaborate geographs of birds, and were really looking forward to cheap alien technology, fusion reactors, and laser guns. The age where bacteria were big and animals were small. Self-explanatory. The cephalopod crisis, fulgurite bugs, the heroic age, the recreation era, the terrible reign of the sport kings, bird age, the groovy age, the tar tarocene epoch, or epic, the second bird age, <laughs> the hour of the watchmaker, the age of exchange, the great cancellation, the mendacious period, the pseudo-predatory collapse. These are great, the worm age, the age of giants. So they're really funny, really, really funny, really, I would say, oozing with inspiration and with flavor. You, you, you can't help but read one of these. And you could, you could just imagine all of the different things that would come about of putting your characters in a world like this or in a particular setting like this, or even just taking a few bits of information, inspiration from this. Um, era of dire hail. Massive equatorial storm systems whip up permanent hailstorms. Hailstorms grow to the size of beach balls, develop miniature slime mold ecosystems, cultures, beliefs, leaders, ice buildings. Eventually they grow too large to float and either colonize adjacent hailstones or plummet to the ground. Oceans develop a thin layer of floating ice. The arthropod apocalypse. Arthropod calypse. Arthropod calypse. That's what it is. <laughs> I can't say that. That's horrifying. The arthropod calypse, a pockmarked zone, the ironic age. So many good ideas in this book. Now, it's not very long, but it is totally great. <laughs> I highly recommend you guys check out the Epocrypha by Scurples. Again, if you just want that inspiration for a bunch of worlds to travel to, if you need inspiration for your backstory, if you want to create a, a more whimsical setting than you usually do, like a more random one than you usually do, something that has a bit more, like, you know, gonzo-ness or weirdness to it. Uh, if you tend to, you know, I, I, I've said this in another video, but I tend to create, left to my own devices, I will create very, very, quote unquote, realistic worlds that have very grounded and have no weirdness to them. <laughs> and it ends up feeling like a variation of modern or medieval Europe or something like that. Um, but having a book like this to, to infuse ideas from weird ideas into your world will shake it up and then and then if you keep some of these ideas and then try to build a medieval system around it you will but the result will be something very different <laughs> so it's a great it's a great way to infuse new things into your world such that your players have a new experience when they approach your new setting or your, your new campaign and you have more fun having a new game the last one is magical industrial revolution by scribbles this is a pre uh, as i said a pre-apocalyptic setting guide now this is one that i think a lot of people are familiar with this is so fantastic it's 156 pages, but it's one of those books. It's a setting book, right? So you're dealing with a sort of pre-apocalyptic setting guide. So it's the book is about Atlantis before the tide turns. It's about Hyperborea before it vanished between dimensions. It's about New York City before the mushroom bombs hit. It's a great setting. Essentially, this is like a sort of... Well, Scrubbles explains that just as we call the medieval era, everything from Constantine through Charlemagne up through, you know, the sort of early, late or maybe early renaissance like all that is the middle ages uh, the medieval world so too he says this is setting this is set in like the you know the georgian victorian pre-world war ii 
post-industrial revolution sort of setting, right? Or that around that period. So it's sort of like the maybe, maybe something like 1700s, 1800s, early or very early 1900s. It's that wide period, right? So it's not set in a particular era, but it's not your typical medieval fantasy. It's an industrial fantasy. And that's not a setting that I think a lot of people play in. And it makes it very interesting here. But what's so great about this book is the writing, the fiction. It's just delightful to read. These ideas are so, so good that you can't help but read it and go, oh man, I really, really want to put this in my world. I want this idea. Oh man, that's so cool. Essentially what you have here is a city, Endon, which is sort of a, a stand-in for London. And then you have um, this theory of magic that makes magic much more organized and structured and therefore usable in a sort of you know studied way by a lot of people but not by everybody certainly but it's sufficiently present in the city to make it kind of a regular part of daily life now the the, the touchstone and at the very end there's a sort of an appendix n and the touchstone here is ankh morpork so if you guys know terry pratchett and sort of the the magical weirdness of terry pratchett cities in particular ankh morpork right where magic is just everywhere and it's sort of like that. It's like there's this constant magic in the background. Not everybody's a wizard. In fact, most people aren't wizards. But magic has become kind of a part of the technology. It's, it's blended with the technology in such a way that it comes up a lot. And so it's pre-apocalyptic though, right? So there are lots and lots of magical technological fusions that you can create that have a good effect for the short term. But over the course of time and expanding, they'll start to cause trouble and probably end in the destruction of all things, <laughs> or at least the destruction of the city. And there is a whole section of this book, and probably the center, I would say the central section of this book, is these apocalypses that are going to result from this fusion of magic and technology, usually just magic, but sort of like mass-produced magic or, or widely spread magic that makes sense when you first use it, but then over time, slowly but surely, kind of goes crazy and, and people start using it in ways that it initially wasn't meant to be used and then it becomes so constant, so so um, ubiquitous that other effects start occurring and those sort of cascade into a sort of an apocalypse. And so if you're playing in this setting, this isn't really a place where you have a typical sort of adventure. It's a city where there's, you know, lots of politics going on, there's lots of factions maybe going around and there's lots of maybe like social role playing going on. It's not really a city where there are going to be tons of dungeons. There are certainly some dungeons you could put in, and there are catacombs beneath the city, for example. There are adventures that are suggested here. But it isn't a sort of typical campaign. You could make it, sort of as he suggests, a hub for a bigger campaign where the players are leaving the city, coming back for the season, which is when all the social people come here, and it's you know the middle of you know, social life is at its height, and that's what the players are trying to enter into, the so society. And then during the non-season times, they go and they have a, you know, campaign or an adventure or something like that. So it's a sort of a place you come back to. But meanwhile, all of these technologies in the background are developing and developing and developing. And as they go, they're causing more and more problems. And so the players can start off by hearing these rumors about these kinds of, you know, magical innovations. And then a few seasons later, those innovations have gotten a bit more advanced. And now the players kind of run into them regularly. And then the bad effects start occurring. And the players realize, oh, we have to do something to stop this if we don't want the city to fall apart or to be destroyed. So a lot of cool ideas there. But but again, what I like about this is that you'll be reading through a page and you're like, oh, that's an interesting idea. And then you'll just start to read a few lines and you'll read the whole thing. You'll be, you'll be glancing through this book and you're like, oh, that's, huh, that's kind of interesting. And then the writing is so delightful. The It's so engaging. It's so funny. And it also makes so much sense. And it's so, you know, it sparks your imagination so much that you can't help but read entire sections that when you originally meant to skim. That was my experience with this book. It's so, so good. And the art is great. Some public domain, some adapted public domain art, and then just some original art throughout. It's really, really good. So I, I highly recommend you guys check this one out. These apocalyptic events, that's, that's the idea. Um, it's really, really cool. The city of Endon. And here you have the basic rundown of the city. The emergency backstory, if you need one. <laughs> Um, and then there are rambles on page 19, which are great. So essentially, as you guys will see, there's the section for like tiny bits of fragments of different kinds of information that you kind of just tell the players maybe a little bit of and they get a sense of what sort of things are being said and the kinds of backstory it might be, but no one really knows for certain and you don't need to make it certain. Um, Endon is cosmopolitan, Endon is complicated, Endoners are humans. 
Uh, I think that's great. There's the important locations, and you'll notice that there are tick marks or little like you know tick boxes next to each of them, and that's because as things advance, as these different technologies advance through the city, the city itself develops, and so over the course of seasons, um, more and more of the city will start to change. And so at first, for example, Broadham Bridge is two narrow lanes for carts and foot traffic, dozens of low arches and old stone posts. But then over time, Broadham Bridge becomes uh, its replace, replacement under construction, broad spans of black iron like cobwebs or lace. And then finally, at the end of that, it's new Broadham Bridge, six lanes held up by cables and wires, a monument to industry. And then there are a couple of NPCs that are associated with each, with each location, and sometimes there's a connection to another location. So with a little thing at the bottom, it's really, really well laid out. Now, it's not hyperlinked or anything like that, but still, this is an older book. It came out a few years ago, quite a few years ago, actually, I think maybe 2018, 2019, something like that. So it's it's older and it doesn't have a lot of the newest sensibilities in terms of its layout, but I think it's still excellent. This is one that I'm, I'm desperate to get in print because I want it and just read, I want to just read through it, <laughs> just, you know, at my leisure. Um, staring at a screen is great, but I love having a book and just sitting down, you know, at the end of a day and just reading through some of these are uh, well-written RPG books. And that's that's what this is. It's a well-written book. A 1D100 buildings divided into social class, uh, general buildings, and then you have the poor, lower class, middle class, upper class, and unusual buildings. Then the, the locations of note there. Weather, there's a certain kind of weather called nightmare fog, which is great. A D100 random encounters. Uh, condensed random encounters by encounter type, by class, by number encounter, by complication, by disposition. So you can roll up much more quickly if you want, instead of just a sort of broad example. And then there's a, a index for useful tables there. And then here are the rambles. I love this. The old fighting pits, the hail of cannon fire, abundant grain, boiled in oil, brought the city to a standstill, rising discontent, a spectacular triumph, right? So none of these are any bits of information. You don't get a whole anything. But you just say a few of these and the players are like, okay, so it's the sort of thing that the city has. Reformists, drainage laws, quarterly, the absconded with half the treasury and a local dancing girl. They formed a powerful block. There was the succession crisis. The first editor sell pies at a hanging. You get the idea. And the same thing with tawdry gossip. Or the same thing with the local events. And then throughout, there are these jokes from Boff Magazine, which is a magazine from the city. And there's sort of jokes about the city um, from the perspective of people there. It's really good gives you a sense of the sort of kind of things that the, the Endeners think, uh, think are thinking about, the kind of problems that they have, the sort of jokes that they find, the things that they find to be ridiculous. It's great. Now here are the different apocalypses. Miles Moving Miracles, or Room to Live. This one's my favorite. I love this one. Well, I don't know if it's my favorite. I shouldn't say that. It's one, it was so good. It is so good. So this idea is, hey, Enden is a crowded city. Well, there are spells that open up extra dimensional spaces like portable hole or rope trick. You know, those from fifth edition, you know, those from other games, right? So there, there are these spells that open up other dimensions. But what if someone decided to start selling space? So they, first, it's this woman named Gloria Eastbrook, and she just wants to add to her house, and so she does, and she makes this really cool place. It's a palace. And she likes it, and, and she starts offering free guided tours, and then she starts to charge for it, and then she thinks, hey, I could sell this. So that she puts up signs, public introduction. Then there is the widespread adoption. Once demand for her own portal starts to spread, other people start to do it. And there are competitors that start to try to undercut her in terms of price. Price, cost falls. Imitations appear on the market. Suddenly, it's not necessarily a novelty anymore. It's now becoming something that people really want. Um, and then people realize, hey, we could, I can have a three bedroom apartment, but I can rent it out to 300 people by having all these different portable holes. And so suddenly there's this just maze of portable rooms, and, and then suddenly you can have a portable room within a portable room, you know, and, and transportation becomes super easy because you just have somebody, a whole bunch of people get into a room and they can relax and have a good time while someone carries them off long distance. A lone courier can carry a village's grain harvest in his hat. So, okay, great, it's expanding and it's becoming more and more useful. And then at the height of its ambition, the, the city has actually shrunk a little bit, but the population has doubled or tripled. However, there are problems. Law enforcement is impossible because anyone can just jump into a portable hole that is connected to like 500 different rooms that all have their own links and connections, and so you can just disappear almost instantly. And, you know, criminals vanish into unmapped mazes of portable rooms because how can you map a constantly expanding and changing city like this? Theft reaches epidemic levels, most shops hire guards, you have explorers for the Ministry of Finance trying to find untaxed people going through and trying to find things, and then there are some problems starting to happen. 
suddenly some rooms that aren't supposed to be connected suddenly start connecting and some things start to blend and you can start to hear people through the walls when you couldn't hear them before and sometimes they fail and people are spilled out into the streets and there's rumors that it's starting to fail and people are being just taken somewhere else entirely who knows and then extra stuff starts to spread this magic which is so ubiquitous now begins to to, to literally just spread and, and go without control. Entrances and things are shifting. And now now what used to be an entrance is no longer an entrance, and it, or it's an entrance to a different place entirely, and people get trapped in these uh, extra-dimensional spaces. Perhaps most people are trapped in these extra-dimensional spaces. No doorway, closet, drawer, or container in the world will be safe as this magic continues to spread and spread and spread and spread. It's a great idea. Rumors of cannibals in the sunless depths. The rich and powerful flee the city. The poor try to live in an ever-shifting ruins. So that's this one technology, one magical technology that has starts off with an initial innovation, goes through public introduction, then there's a widespread adoption, then there's a scope alteration, then there's the height of ambition, then there's a terminal event. And then there's some notes about how you can avert this apocalypse. And there's, that's true for each of these apocalypses. And as you can see, they're great ideas. It takes what... Uh, you have a spell, and it takes... A kind of a common sense approach. Hey, how how would this spell work if it really existed in real life? What would people do with it? And you see that as it goes through. There are lots of true polymorph is another one. If true polymorph really existed, what would happen? Well, the poor would start to eat better, but polymorph meat would sort of be seen like lab-grown meat, right? At first, it wouldn't really be seen as anything that you wouldn't really want it. But then you might start to say, okay, well, maybe we could start to polymorph things into kind of more exotic animals and have cool zoos. And maybe we could try to find long extinct creatures and polymorph into them. And maybe there'd be some people who say, well, can we polymorph into things that are just in our imaginations, non-existent creatures? And it would go and go and go and go until suddenly, well, you'd have some horrible creatures that would come out, it would be polymorphed into and would spread rapidly through, you know, accidental means. You'd create some horrible thing that, that instantly replicates and dooms the city or you would you know in the example here is you create a bunch of dinosaurs and they break free and they start eating things great idea the peaceful city a conjured workforce coal and iron the power of creation itself and then there's d20 apocalyptic omens now that's just the first 40 pages of the book the rest of the book is essentially services justice spells how, how, how justice works how diseases are here accommodations transport social classes newspapers all the details that you might need to run a sort of social game here and the sorts of things that you might run into. The political parties, the monarch, and the season itself, the social calendar, the deadly sins, how to carouse, the contemporary songs, the magical industry, and all the prices and things like that. You run through the entire city and it's essentially just spells, magic items, how to live here, potions, um, prosthetic limbs, NPCs and rumors, tons of wizards and nobles, useful NPCs from the different social classes, how the mob works as a monster. You can use it as a, as a stat block and as a thing. Thieves and urchins, scoundrels, wrongs and injustices, some special monsters, and there's some great ones in here. Gel Knights, the Ghost Whale of Endon, the Speaking Rat Society, Stray Spells, Thom of Voric Eels, Tunnel Trolls, and then a few dungeons at the back of the book that are uh, laid out here. The Bells of St. Bristow, the biggest Aspidistra in the world, and then some generic dwellings, the World Wonder Mansion Generator, <laughs> and then some appendices. Reasons to visit for each of the classes or by generic reasons. Plot, plot hook generators, lectures at Loxton College, plays and operas, and an index. And finally, a bibliography, sort of an appendix, and for all the stuff you can read and get into in order to understand it a bit better. I think it's so good. Going postal. It says, if you're looking for a place to start, Going Postal is probably the closest in tone and scope to the content of this book. And Going Postal is a fantastic, fantastic... Uh, well, I've seen the film, the movie. Um, I have not read it, but I think it's a fantastic movie, at least. <laughs> I love Terry Pratchett. I searched the body, and then pre-session checklist, and solved my problem sheet. Magical Industrial Revolution is a fantastic book, even if you're just not, you're not interested in running in an industrial fantasy setting or a city setting, you just want ideas. And again, the right, if you just want something to read that is fun to read, this book is fun to read. I highly recommend you guys check it out. Okay, so we had Magical Industrial Revolution, The Apocrypha, Book of Speculative Ages, and The Sorcerer's Enclave. I'll put links below to where you can get them all. Highly recommend them all, guys, as great sources of inspiration. And that'll do it for this one. 
i'll see you guys all in another video.